a disputed deposit. So um, we're going to go through the slides quickly. I'm just going to give another 30 seconds or so for the attendees to catch up. Yep, it looks like you're all on now. So any questions, any issues, please do use that um, comment box on the bottom right of the screen. If you have any questions throughout, as always, just make sure you raise them. If I can answer them throughout, I will do. Otherwise, we'll have a dedicated session towards the end. So first of all, um, just running through a bit about Make Your Move, who we are, what we do. Um, we've been established since 2008. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we were established by landlords to provide services for landlords. It was an alternative solution for landlords and tenants alike, as opposed to using the traditional method of high street agents. Um, we provide a supportive role to both parties and we aim is to remove the the costs associated and time spent using technology and powering that by professionals within the industry. I've been involved with Make Your Move since the very beginning. My personal experience is brought to this coming as it from a landlord and a tenant and also uh, spend a lot of time making sure that I am fully up to speed with what's going on within the industry. Um, my passion is technology. I do lead a solution led strategy um, and I, we always operate on a customer first approach. Um, so for those of you that use our service, hopefully you'll agree that that is delivered. So what we're going to cover today. Um, so first of all, let's, let's explain the, the reason why we've chosen this subject. Uh, we've had a couple of recent incidents where landlords have come to us for advice about how to deal with a deposit dispute. Um, it's not quite so easy to deal with these uh, when you're just coming in at the end. Um, so what we wanted to cover off today is setting up the tenancy what administration you should endure, how you should deal with things towards the end of a tenancy, and we will cover during as well, retentions and evidence that you need, how you can deal with a dispute, the various schemes and their arbitration and resolutions, and then we'll do some Q&A. So first of all, let's just cover off the approved deposit schemes. Um, if you use our service, you will most likely use the deposit protection service. Um, this originally was set up as a custodial scheme. What that means is you pay your money to them and they protect it and hold it throughout the, the term of the tenancy. There is now an insured scheme with the DPS um, where you can retain the money and you just pay a fee to insure it. So you need to still retain it in a separate account. You can't use it within your normal account. It needs to be ring fenced, um, but you need to have a protection certificate over that money. My deposits is another scheme. I think we do get quite a lot of people that use this as well. Again, um, I think originally it was an insurance backed scheme. They now offer a custodial service too. Uh, so you can choose to send a deposit to them or keep it yourself. And then there is the tenancy deposit scheme, originally set up as an insured scheme, uh, now offering both custodial and insured. Um, we're not going to cover it so much on here, but there is also now a, a, a new sort of service, which is an insured deposit scheme where your tenant pays. What your tenant will do is they will pay um, an insurance premium. I think a lot of these are coming out at roughly one week's rent, um, and then that will give a varying amount of cover between six weeks and 12 weeks for the deposit. The idea being that towards the end of that deposit release, uh, the tenant is responsible for covering the cost of any damage or any unpaid rent. And if they don't, then the landlord can make a claim to the insurance scheme. So I'm just introducing that now. We haven't gone into much detail. It is something we're exploring as being able to offer to our landlords. Um, it may prove to be more useful for landlords as we look at the deposit cap, which is about to come in with a tenant fee ban in June, which limits the amount of money you can hold to five weeks. So moving on, setting up the tenancy. Um, hopefully uh, most of you on here will, will know how to do this and will have done it plenty of times, um, but we'll just run through it. So the first thing you need to do when you receive the deposit is lodge it with an approved scheme within 30 days. So if it's a custodial, it needs to be transferred to them. And if it's an insured scheme, you need to make sure that you've lodged it as received and then provide the, get the certificate of insurance. If you have a tenancy contract, you need to make sure that the details associated with the scheme, and these are usually just generic clauses because all the schemes have the same, which provides a tenant with information on when and how that deposit can be retained. Um, in addition to that, you will need the specific prescribed terms of each scheme to be provided to the tenant 
prior to them signing the contract and getting the keys. So it's no good providing it afterwards. It needs to be provided before the contract signing or at the same time. Um, if you use our service, you will use a digital signature service on a lot of the packages. Um, and this is sent out at exactly the same time as the tenancy contract. Um, once you've lodged the deposit, you will also get a certificate. It, the schemes themselves tend to email the tenant as long as you've provided the contact details to confirm that the deposit is now lodged and protected with them and give them the deposit ID and their repayment ID details um, so that they can request it back. So it isn't, strictly speaking, you do need to provide the certificate to the tenant. So it's best to maybe download a copy of the certificate and just send an email over and then just keep a date or a recording of the date that you've sent that just for your own protection. Other admin, um, these are particularly important when it comes to dealing with the return of the deposit. So an inventory may obviously carry out a detailed schedule of, in, of condition at the start of the tenancy, go through this with the tenant, give the tenant the appropriate time frame to raise any um, amendments that they'd like to make, um, make sure that you take plenty of photographs and you record that you have provided the tenant a copy and that they've had sufficient time period to raise any concerns. You need to keep receipts of everything that you purchase. Um, you should be doing this anyway from an accounting point of view, but if you purchase a brand new cooker, for example, um, if you have to make a claim on it at the end, it helps if you've got a receipt to confirm that it definitely was brand new. So the most common type of retentions, um, unsurprisingly, unpaid rent is the biggest one. Um, this seems to be um, particularly in cases where tenants have moved out of a contract early um, and not paid or not provide sufficient notice in line with the terms of the contract. So examples of this is they've contacted you on the 15th of January and they've told you that they're going to move out on the 30th of January, but your contract stipulates that they actually need to provide you a month's notice. So they only pay you up to the 30th of January and you're going to make a claim for the remaining 14 days of February that you want to get that um, money back from the deposit. Now, this tends to be where the biggest issue is when it comes to the value of a deposit. So unpaid rent, as you understand, can take up quite a lot of the deposit amount and often doesn't leave room for any other um, retentions that you need to, to take out. A lot of the schemes want you to note that the deposit is not to protect you when it comes to rent and that there are other measures, but it's obviously the easiest route. So yes, it is one of the biggest claims. The other one is unpaid bills. Um, so this is something that's often forgotten, but has your tenant paid all the bills? Council tax, gas, electricity, water, any other utilities that are provided that they must pay for under the contract. Um, ideally, you want them to declare that they have. Unfortunately, you only get 10 days normally to confirm your retentions. So unpaid bills, whilst it is a common complaint, is usually not actually added to a retention if you're using a custodial scheme. Missing items, this is where your inventory has become really important. So being able to match off items at the end of a tenancy with those at the start of a tenancy. Um, Common missing items, and it sounds silly, but um, uh, cutlery trays uh, within the drawers, if you've provided those. Um, mattress covers, mattress protectors, uh, they're quite common. Um, other missing items will be things like uh, pictures, toilet roll holders. There has been claims for toilet brushes and um, things like that, all of which you need to go through on your inventory and, and just be quite thorough when you're doing your check to make sure everything's still there. But when you've done your inventory in the first place, either you take a photo of everything in the room or you itemize it. The easiest way to do it is to itemize. Damage, um, again, it's quite common. Um, iron burns on the carpet, uh, cigarette burns. Um, and we'll get on to smells in a minute, um, but cigarette burns, uh, damage to the walls where people have hung things but not uh, dealt with the holes afterwards, um, damage to uh, the side of the sinks maybe and baths, um, toilets, chips on porcelain, uh, these are all quite common things to claim. Lack of maintenance is another one. Um, so the most common source of complaint with this is the um, silicon around the bath uh, not being cleaned correctly or the windows themselves, so failing to ventilate that area or wipe down the interiors of the windows to prevent any mold um, condensation building up. Cleaning as a whole um, is quite common. Again, 
a bit of a difficult one. We will go over this to put into your claim because you are only entitled to the return of the property in the condition that it was provided. Um, cleaning is very much about your own personal perception. So what might be clean for one person is not really clean for another. Um, the schemes tend to use a, a a standard method when it comes to cleanliness so if it was a professional clean at the start and you've documented it in the inventory and you've got a receipt then you are entitled to have it back to the same standard at the end but that does not necessarily mean that the tenant has to have it professionally cleaned um, as long as it's similar um, it's also really important that you photograph everything at the start and at the end uh, because it sounds daft, but um, some cleaning issues are not very easy to see on photographs. Um, so we'll come over other methods that you can use when it comes to cleaning. Um, left items is another big one. So, and I'm not talking about not emptying the bin. Um, we've had con some properties, and I'm sure you've all experienced it as well, where tenants have actually left furniture personal belongings um, you have to deal with the removal you have to deal with the storage in line with your statutory obligations and there are costs involved which you can recover from the deposit when all of these things add up it's quite easy to see how quickly um, you can use up those deposit funds um, but what we're going to recover now is, is basically ways in which you can deal with this throughout the tenancy so that it's not a, bit a, a bigger issue at the end. Um, so we're going to have a look at how we can avoid these disputes. So the biggest, easiest way is to make sure you're staying in constant contact with your tenant, uh, you carry out regular inspections, and then you deal with any ma maintenance or damage as highlighted on the inspection at the time of the inspection. Um, so I'll mention it quickly now, um, but there is a liability insurance policy that is offered to all our tenants here through Make Your Move if they if they want to get a quote. That liability insurance policy covers the fixtures, fittings and contents provided by the landlord. Um, what that helps is, is if they damage something throughout, they can claim for its repair during the tenancy. So you're not waiting until the end of the tenancy. If they don't have this in place, so it's always worth asking them at the start of a tenancy if they do, um, then they will need to deal with that damage themselves. You can't make a claim during the tenancy. You can make it at the end because their responsibility is to maintain the property to a good standard, but the obligation is to return it to you at the end of the tenancy in a condition that's relevant to what it was at the start, allowing for fair wear and tear. So therefore, the only thing you can really do is highlight it. Uh, good examples of this is curtain poles falling down. Um, you can spot that on an inspection. You can raise it with the tenant and you can ask them to deal with the repair. You can raise any potential cleaning issues as well. Now, this is always a little bit of a difficult subject. Um, it's probably more prominent with room rent students in particular, um, but you can highlight that the property isn't quite to the standard that you would expect, that you feel is normal, um, are reasonable to expect, and therefore you would suggest that they pick up some, some, either give them some cleaning tips or arrange for someone to come and do a clean, or maybe just ask them to keep it a bit more cleaner and then, you know, record that conversation within the inspection. Providing appliance instructions and care advice is another one. If you fit, for an example, a really expensive Candine flooring um, and you don't provide the tenant with care instructions for how to deal with that and they whack a load of bleach on that and that damages the flooring, you are going to struggle to demonstrate to the arbitrators of the scheme that you're entitled to recovery of those costs to replace that flooring because it's unusual types of flooring and you need to make sure you're given the relevant care advice. Um, similar issues with uh, high gloss kitchen units, um, not using particular cleaning products on those, um, just using cloths and water, not polishing them um, is another one that has come up before. Um, so all these little things, if there are specific instructions that they need and specific advice around care, make sure you provide it and make sure you document it. If you spot these throughout, Go and find those instructions and care advice and give it to them. Once you've raised it with the tenant and you've recorded that raise and you can rely on it at the end. Um, so the checkout report is also very important. Ideally, you want the tenant to be present and you would like this to be completed by an independent clerk. 
because you have more success when it comes down to it. It's not your personal perception. It is an independently recorded report against the ingoing inventory. If your tenant's present, you can get tenant's feedback on those issues as you go around. So if you go into the bathroom and you spot that the silicone is a little bit black and needs to be taken out and put back in, you kind of get the tenant to agree that yes, they, they see that, they recognize that it is excessive fur wear and tear and that it does have some work required. And you can actually record their comments. Um, this works both ways. So um, where an inventory clerk might not be aware of the incidents that have gone on throughout a tenancy. Uh, one example is a leak. There was a leak at the property, the landlord's dealt with it, but the redecoration hasn't taken place, well, either because the landlord didn't want to do it while the tenant was there or the tenant didn't want to do it themselves. Whatever reasons, the landlord is go the, the inventory clerk is going to go in and record damage to the decor based on what looks like a water leak but the tenant being present can say oh that's because of a water leak which the landlord knows about and that comment can be recorded which will help you when it comes to determining is it the tenant's responsibility or the landlord's responsibility if the tenant isn't present the best thing to do is to record the discrepancies between the inventory and the checkout and then give it to them as soon as possible so you don't need to highlight any issues that you're going to deal with as far as the compensation goes you just need to give them a chance to review it themselves so just send them a quick email here's your checkout report here's the original inventory if it's not already on there as a comparison um, just welcome your comments on anything that comes up as tenant responsibility. Um, normally what that does is it prepares the tenant for anything that that might be coming their way as far as retentions go um, and it will just ease the pain a little bit because sometimes landlords just say right I'm retaining £600 from your £800 deposit and, and then that becomes as a bit of a shock so the immediate response from a tenant is to argue it but if you send the, the reports first then you're sort of highlighting to them that there are issues highlight it as being tenant responsibility and you will be in touch shortly about the uh, retentions. So fair wear and tear, um, this catches a lot of people out when they get to dispute stage. Um, if you're using an arbitrator, their responsibility is a measure of fair wear and tear. Now, I think the TDS scheme is really good at this. Uh, they have um, sort of checklists on their site that they will highlight what they consider fair wear and tear when it comes to the length of a tenancy, the numbers of tenants and occupation. So the definition of fair wear and tear, it, it, is, it does have a definition that's largely used in a legal practice and that is one that says reasonable use of the premises by the tenant and the ordinary operation of natural forces. Um, what this translates to is where the items have been used in their correct and ordinary way and they have suffered some natural deterioration, then that's fine. You're not entitled to betterment. So you do have to consider the length of the occupation and the number of tenants that have been using your facilities when you're deciding whether or not it's excessive fair wear and tear. So, and, and we'll cover this off a little bit more as well. So this does include where, I think the DPS is particularly uh, stringent on this, but where you have, say, a cigarette burn on a carpet, um, and we haven't covered the smells, but we will do, where you have a cigarette burn on a carpet and the claim is to replace the entire carpet, the DPS will look at whether or not you're entitled to the full recovery of those costs, A, based on the length of the tenancy, and then B, based on whether or not that damage is sufficiently place to require a full replacement or can it be covered by a rug for example and this is kind of what you're agreeing to when you agree to use their arbitration service so just really consider is it fair wear and tear is it excessive um, and there are obvious cases where it's excessive if there's a hole in a door for example where it's quite obvious someone's punched it then that is absolutely relevant to a claim so the tenancy end um, your, you've received your notice from your tenant um, you've been doing regular inspections anyway but now you're going to arrange a checkout inspection and you're going to ask the tenant to be there you're going to check the condition against the original inventory you'll highlight any areas that require attention either at the appointment or if they're not present you'll follow up with that afterwards you do consider fair wear and tear it's always good to actually um, 
write down fair wear and tear where you don't believe there is a recording of a deterioration, but that deterioration is not responsible uh, for the tenant. So you just mark it down as fair wear and tear. Uh, make a list of all of the items which you need to cost up for repair or replacement, and then send that to the tenant. Um, the notification to the tenant that you're going to be doing work is sufficient as far as the requirement with the DPS to tell them. What evidence do you need then? So at the very least, with any claim that you put through any deposit scheme, you're going to need a copy of the tenancy agreement. Um, there'll be different items required for different types of claims, but it's always good to have a statement of rent account, especially if you're considering claiming for unpaid rent. Uh, a copy of any bills, especially where you can be claiming for unpaid bills. Um, the inventory with photographs, ideally, and the checkout. If you've not got a full inventory and a full checkout report, but you do have like a, a timed and date stamped photograph of an item, and then you have this, the same item photographed at the end, you can just use that. P any periodic inspection reports. So if you want to measure cleanliness, for example, you can use the inspection reports. It's not always wise to send those in. Sometimes the first and the last is sufficient. So just consider whether or not it helps your claim. Any correspondence between you and the tenant, and this is where getting them to confirm on the checkout and on the inventory that they accept it is really important. Um, text messages as well can be used, uh, WhatsApp messages, anything really that is recordable with a date and time that suggests that they, you've come to some sort of an agreement can be used. Quotes for work are fine. Receipts are more likely to be received. Um, and receipts for any purchased items where you're claiming damage. Um, what not to claim? I'll go through these scenarios with you in a minute, but I'm just going to cover smells because we talked about cigarette burns. Um, a lot of landlords don't permit smoking in their property. Um, one of the things that a lot of landlords will find when they go and do an inspection is that there is a smell as if someone's been smoking in the property. Now, each scheme has different rules about how they deal with smell. Um, so smell can be ventilation, but in some instances, if you can prove it, which is the difficulty you'll have because arbitrators only deal with visual, um, you may need to redecorate a room. You may need to replace carpets or have them deep cleaned. Um, so don't dismiss smells. Um, definitely explore whether or not a smell leads to a requirement for you to do additional work which incurs costs and do consider putting that claim in. It's always best to combine that with something else. So, for example, there is a smell of smoke and you think you need to redecorate, but is there any staining on the walls that will support that more? So just think about that. Um, so we'll go through these scenarios. Um, what not to claim for uh, scenario one um, was a claim for complete redecoration following a six year tenancy and including new carpets. Um, where there isn't specific damage to the walls or the carpets, which is considered excessive, this claim will not succeed. Um, the reason for that is um, the standard policy for uh, most of the deposit schemes is that anything over three years really largely will be considered fair wear and tear. And then they start to look at the grade of the, the fittings. So if you've used a luxury carpet, they expect that to have like a 15, 10 to 15 year shelf life. If you've used a basic carpet, a very basic carpet, they expect them to have two to five, five years maximum. Um, and after that time period that you will need to cover the cost of full replacement. So just consider that your fair wear and tear is really relevant when it comes to the length of a tenancy. Scenario two is a claim for structural maintenance, such as repointing or roof tiling. Um, the claim was made um, based on the fact that the tenant hadn't reported that the pointing and the roof tiling needed to be done, and therefore the work that was then done um, was more costly because it had been delayed. Unfortunately, landlords are responsible for the structural maintenance of a building. It's their responsibility to track the maintenance of a building from its structural point of view and deal with it throughout the tenancy. Uh, the tenant's not responsible. Um, you can't rely on the tenant reporting such issues unless it's absolutely obvious. So, for example, if the roof tiling had slipped so badly it was causing leaks into the loft and that leak had been going on for three years and then there was significant damage, yes, you can expect that that, that leak would have been obvious and the tenant should have reported it. And you can use a breach under the terms of a tenancy in order to make a claim. But where it comes to things like this, you can't. 
Scenario three, uh, complete redecoration of a room where a tenant had hung one picture um, and they moved out, they took the picture down, they didn't fill the hole. Um, sorry, they had filled the hole and they'd painted over just that little section, not the whole wall. So the claim was that the whole room needed to be redecorated as a result. Um, this was rejected um, as an outright claim, but there was a partial award made um, and it was a very nominal amount of £20 to cover the maintenance of the whole room for two reasons. Uh, one, they have to deliver it back to you um, with the allowance for fair wear and tear. So filling the hole and painting over it um, so whilst it was visible, um, it doesn't warrant the entire room being painted. And the second one being that the it likelihood was that at some point within the next six to 12 months, the landlord would need to completely repaint that room anyway. Um, so there was a very nominal amount awarded and not a full claim. So just consider it. I think uh, there is a mentality to submit more in your claim than you actually want in the hope that you will get some sort of award. It is always best to submit a claim for exactly the amount that you want, um, because sometimes if you'd have asked for £50 towards the cost of redecoration of a room there rather than £250 for the whole room, you may well have got the £50. So just consider that. Best practice. Um, so contact your tenant as soon as you know you're going to be making a retention. Uh, this will be obvious to you when you're doing the checkout. And if they're present, it will be obvious to them. And um, with the GPS, I think you have 10 working days to release the deposit to the tenant or confirm that you'll be making a retention. It is possible for you to email them and say, we've done the inspection report, we've reviewed it, there are some concerns and some issues, we will be applying for a retention to your deposit and leave it at that um, and then follow up within a timely manner with a list of all the items you're claiming for and the costs that are associated. You can provide evidence to them in support, so this would normally be your inventory, your checkout. Um, you may want to provide them with quotes, estimates and bills. Uh, you don't have to though, uh, but you can confirm to them on the list that you do have evidence should it be required for the deposit scheme. Um, and then you just request that they confirm the retention um, within a set time frame. Seven days is appropriate. Um, so if you say to them, here's a list of the items that are damaged or that need repair, here's the costs associated, here's the reports associated, and we'd like you to confirm in writing that you accept this within seven days. Now, the reason this is important is that if you don't get an email back, you can rely, or you do get an email back saying, yes, that's fine, and then they dispute it, you can rely on that piece of communication as part of your evidence. So the Alternative Dispute Resolution, or ADR, these are provided by most of the schemes. With the insured scheme, because you're holding the money, as soon as anything goes through to ADR, and this is something you need to both agree to at the outset of a claim, um, you will need to transfer the disputed amount. So if the deposit was £1,000, you've submitted a claim for £400. Your tenant has agreed to £200, but not the other £200. It's the £200 that you'll need to transfer to the scheme. You keep the £200, and the remaining £600 will go back to the tenant. If it's custodial, then the disputed amount will stay with the custodial scheme, and any of the remaining amounts will be delivered back to the parties as agreed by the parties. So same, same scenario. If they're holding it, you'll get a payment for anything that's agreed and the tenant will get the rest back and the disputed amount stays where it is. Um, you both accept that an independent adjudicator can review the evidence at the outset. So you need to tick to confirm that you accept that an independent adjudicator can review the evidence should it be requested and that you fully accept the decision of that adjudicator and it's binding. There are time limits as well on providing evidence. So make sure that when you do this, You've got a file set up on your computer with all of the documents that you're going to need. Um, what to do if a tenant doesn't respond? Um, so quite often uh, you will get, especially where you're telling the tenant they're going to take all the money, um, you will get them not responding. So you'll submit to, for example, a DPS to say that you're entitled to all the funds. Um, you'll submit, that will go to the tenant requesting their confirmation they've not responded within 14 days, then you can make a statutory declaration. So you make a claim for the funds with the custodial schemes using this. And a stat deck is a form that you need to complete, outlining the reasons why you believe that you're 
entitled to the funds and then you need to get that signed and witnessed by a solicitor then you can submit it the other alternative is to actually go to court and um, so you can take this claim to the courts to get them to issue you with a court order for the funds which you then issue to the deposit scheme you with some of the insured schemes they have an absent tenant procedure which is your independent resolution um, now this is entirely at your own risk so you can claim that you've used all reasonable methods to try and track down the tenant to get them to agree and that you're independently confirming that this is the right resolution um, and that you will retain the money um, so if it's already with you you'll retain it one thing to bear in mind with that is that the tenants do have six years from the date of the end of the tenancy to make a claim through the courts for that money so you may just decide to take the risk of hold taking that money for yourself but then should there be a claim against you be prepared to have to have that money back paid back um, if you have no claim on the funds then you literally just need to hold the funds I'm afraid um, so if you're holding with the insured scheme and the tenant disappears you don't have any claim over the funds but the tenant hasn't claimed the money back from you you need to keep hold of it and um, seek independent legal advice um, but this is one of the reasons why the custodial scheme is quite useful because it's their responsibility to keep hold of the funds so that it will just stay with the custodial scheme until the tenant appears. Um, there have been a number of suggestions lately that's like, well, if they've not claimed it, you can spend it. No, you can't. Um, it's not your money, unfortunately. So, yeah, you just need to ring fence it and keep hold of it and take, seek independent legal advice and, and then take the risk if you want to use it for your own funds that you may need to put it back if there is a claim made. Okay, um, that is everything covered off. Um, so we'll now go to questions. Um, thank you very much for attending. If you have any questions, please do let us know. Okay, we've got a hold and deposit query. Okay, so hold and deposits are separate to registered deposits so if you take a hold and deposit from a tenant it will need to have its own terms and conditions associated so within the hold and deposit you need to confirm how it will be used when it will be returned if it will be returned when it will be retained if it will be retained and then how it will be used following any application process so you don't need to lodge the hold and deposit with the deposit protection scheme but you do need to keep it within the time set time frame the tenant fee bill will permit holding deposits, um, but if you haven't dealt with something, I think it's 15 days is the time frame that you need to return it in full. Are there any other questions? No, okay. Um, so the, the webinar itself has been recorded. Um, what we'll do is we'll uh, get the video put together and submit it onto the YouTube channel. You will get a link for that YouTube channel tomorrow. If there's anything that you want to look over, feel free. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask is if you have any specific queries related to the lessons industry that you think would make a nice topic for a webinar that you'd like us to cover off, please do email it in to us, admin at makeyourmove.co.uk. Um, if you have any questions about this particular subject or anything that you think a member of staff will be able to help you with, do get in touch. You've got our contact details. Um, oh, sorry, just a quick question. Uh, okay, so what should I do if a tenant tells me uh, the lot of the furniture breakage and he just threw it away without informing you? Okay, so th this would be missing items when it comes down to your report. So if you go through your inventory at the start and then at the end, uh, the item was broken is a, is a valid excuse, but they need to prove it. Uh, so submit it as if the item has been removed. So one uh, chairs, dining chairs and tables are quite common for this. So the, the or a wardrobe as well has been has been one that I've come across. Um, if the wardrobe was broken to the extent that that it needed to be removed, the normal practice would be the tenant would tell you at the time, and you could you could get the proof of that. Your requirement really is to replace that furniture as a landlord. So if you've not had an opportunity to do that, then you can't. Um, but mark it down as a missing item get their um, response if they tell you that it was broken and they threw it away then ask them for proof of that 
when it comes to your claim with the dispute service or the resolution service, they will ask the tenant to prove it. So the tenant can make any claims they want, but they will need to prove it just the same way as you do. There is a higher burden of proof on you, but your burden of proof is that on the inventory report, it was there and on the checkout report, it wasn't. Um, and you've had no communication in between to suggest that those items have been broken beyond repair. Um, so I hope that's answered the question. If you do have any question, further queries on that, then do reach out. I can always go through this individually. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Um, um, May I wish you all a happy Wednesday afternoon and we'll see you again on a future one.